Hey, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with AR. I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Delaware and Maryland. These two states are facing very similar challenges today, and they're on the same path forward as they deal with transformative changes to their coastal landscapes. For both Maryland and Delaware, you're talking about a big coastal cultural presence and a big coastal facing economy. It's not gonna be a big shock to anyone that sea level rise is the major challenge here in our 2050 forecast. But especially when you're talking about estuary rich coastlines, flood sensitive coastlines, rising seas have complex impacts. Delaware, for example, is looking at potential power issues. The projected high end of sea level rise for 2050 would double the number of vulnerable power plants in the state, putting about a gigawatt of generation capacity at risk. Let's take a look at where the coastline itself is gonna experience dramatic changes. I'm afraid that in these states, we are looking at community inundation. We're gonna check out some of the worst impacted areas first. Let's get over to the NOAA sea level rise viewer. So right now we're at the mean higher high water mark. We're anticipating between two and three feet of sea level rise by 2050 under our, our most likely future pathway. I'm gonna model three feet because with these sort of gently sloping shores, if I model two feet, there's going to be a lot of impact beyond the coastline that you see, right? The salt water is gonna get into the soil. There's gonna be more flooding during storms and high tides. I feel if we model three feet, that gives you a better idea of where the actual safe retreat point is because of how intertwined land and sea are in this landscape. And if we model three feet, we see a lot of major loss, a lot of big reductions in land, big changes to the coastline. This whole area here is uh, profoundly impacted. Let's go to the current mean higher high water mark and look into the Chesapeake Bay here. So this is a lot of very valuable habitat for so many living things, huge recreation potential, very beautiful place. You can see all of that marginal area is going to turn to sea. And if we get a little closer to where this margin is, it's historically crucial. It is agricultural. It is a national wildlife refuge. And you can't imagine that this agricultural area here that is above the margin is gonna be completely unaffected. I would anticipate that a place here, say, that has salt water encroaching on all three sides is going to have severely changed soil. So this is worse than I expected when I looked at this. You know, I think that many of us who are kind of climate aware, who pay attention to the sea level rise stuff, when we look at the Florida forecast, we expect that we're gonna see a lot of community level impact. When we look at the Louisiana forecast, we expect a lot of community level impact. Look over here on this side of the peninsula, Delaware and Maryland, go to three feet, zoom in on like Ocean City. Huge amount of housing stock inundated in what looks like a very pleasant and economically productive area, right? Go up north of the border. Same thing, Fenwick Island, you're losing a lot of housing stock. Over here, other side of Montego Bay, it's a lot of what looks like luxury housing stock. We're easily talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars of property damage on this screen alone. And not just damage where you're gonna be able to recover from it, it's like total loss. In the New York, uh, coastal New York video, I talk about building a seawall because it's possible to do it there. But there's no way to enclose like this entire area, right? And if you shut off the Chesapeake Bay, you're gonna lose access to this big naval base down here in Virginia. So the only way forward here is to accept these challenges. And I feel like if you're taking a look at this, it ought to help you to develop more compassion for our countrymen on, in the mid-Atlantic there. They don't get a lot of press as being like highly vulnerable and needing help, whereas some people around the Gulf do. You only have to look at that to see that this is an area where people are gonna need a lot of help and where there's gonna be a lot of loss, a lot of grief. This is an upsetting overview, I know, 
But if you're in these areas, don't panic. It's not coming all at once. And I'm sure you've already seen warning signs like increased flooding, seeing the pines die, fast beach erosion. It's sad, but you know, identifying places where it makes sense to dig in, where it's worth it to invest, that's gonna be the key to resilience in these vulnerable coastal states. And there's a lot of work being done in these states to build resilience. With those big projected sea level rise impacts, you've got to imagine people are trying a lot of things. Delaware is doing some interesting agricultural work. They're testing these salt tolerant crops like seashore mallow in agricultural areas that are going to be vulnerable to that salt water incursion, keep the soil healthy and productive for as long as it can, and then have a native transitional plant to support the transition to marshland. In Maryland, the Living Shorelines Project is a big deal. They've been supporting property owners to accept and scaffold the changes that are coming. They're preparing the coastline for transition by moving away from hard stabilizers like concrete, where you got to pull it out after the sea level overtops it, towards soft stabilizers like sand and encouraging marsh development. Marsh development especially is going to do more to prevent coastal erosion and mitigate the effects of the rise. On the marsh front though, you do have another challenge, unfortunately, and that's invasive nutria. I wanna show you a picture of them. If you haven't seen these guys, they look kind of like big rats. They're not a dangerous animal, like on a one-on-one -on -one interaction. They're not gonna bite you, even though they have these big scary teeth. They're a vegetarian animal from South America that was introduced to the US for its fur. Unsurprisingly, this didn't work out because you just have to look at the nutria to realize that their fur is unappealing and nasty. And these animals are, uh, they're jerks. They're already into the southern end of Maryland. They're likely to get all the way up into Delaware by 2050. They eat everything. They turn marsh into shallow open water, which is like your worst scenario in terms of buffering against storm surge. And it's going to really hurt our ability to protect these shorelines, the more they get established. So you gotta keep an eye out for them. And if you own property in one of these transitional areas where you haven't yet seen them, preventative trapping will help to protect your property. Let's take a few minutes to look at the projected changes to the summer and the winter, give you an idea of why these nutrients are gonna be able to move all the way up the coastline. We're looking at some big changes. Let's look over at the USDA heat zone map and look at some summer changes first. So this map, the colors represent the number of days over 86 degrees. Right now, we're looking at our contemporary data, which is from the 80s to 2009. Close to contemporary, right? We see that the further inland you get, the cooler it is in Maryland, that the Atlantic side has been usually cooler by about a month and then the Chesapeake Bay. But we need to look into the future now. We're going to look at RCP 4.5 scenario at mid-century. This represents reduced emissions, not enough to offset the impacts of climate change, but enough to mitigate the worst effects. And I think it's our most likely future. We've got totally different colors on the map here after we get the mid-century modeling up. You can see that the cool summer is preserved here in this very western tip of Maryland and that the foothills of the mountains do experience much of the same heat up as other parts of the inland state. This new color here, this red, that represents up to 120 days over 86 a month, so much warmer. And in much of the Atlantic coast, we've gone from this sort of mint color to red, so a doubling of the summer or in this little area here, maybe just another month of summer, a little bit of cool preservation. But this is transformational heat. This is a tremendous change to the length of summer heat, probably indicating a couple additional weeks of growing season in the spring and a couple additional weeks of growing season in the fall. And let's see what that's gonna do to the winter temperatures as we look over to the plant hardiness zones. Right now, we can see that Maryland and Delaware both are mainly in zone seven with some zone six in the mountains and some zone eight down here at the tip of Chesapeake Bay. And this is what to watch when you're looking at the landscape transformation that's coming. Mid-century at RCP 4.5, you can see the changes right there. Look at that zone eight area. It has expanded across like the whole peninsula all the way up into Philadelphia. And we can see that it's also come up into Baltimore there. That zone eight, that very mild winter 
is what is going to allow the salt marsh ecosystem that's currently in the Carolinas to come all the way up into here. And the nutria could come all the way up into here, but it's possible that you can get healthy ecosystems that include enough predators to get out of there. Let's take a second, let's take a step back and talk about what this transition is going to feel like. Western Maryland, up against the mountains, looking at some changes, but not too bad. You've got some summer heat um, conservation, relatively cool summers, and you've got some winter cool conservation. Not bad, nice for cultural continuity. As you look towards the sea, that whole peninsula is looking increasingly similar to what Myrtle Beach is like today. So that's an area with tourism potential. It's thought by many to be a pleasant climate. That should inform the fact that in areas where it's worth digging in, we should think about this as a climate with perhaps more year round tourism potential, not just a summer destination. With the living shorelines approach to sea level rise, working to construct and encourage a new beach, to construct and encourage a new estuary, these are the kinds of innovative forward thinking approaches that are gonna lead to opportunity for you. Across America today, if you create habitat, there's already a teeming flood of life looking to get in there. Every living thing is moving north. There's no place that's more true than this incredibly biologically rich area on the mid-Atlantic, and it has great physical land and sea connections to habitat just south of the Chesapeake Bay that would allow for species migration. It's not always true in many states, like in my forecasts for Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, I touch on the fact that there isn't a great migration corridor for native species south of those states to get to what could become a very solid new habitat area. People will have to do a lot of work to introduce transitional species in some of those states, but that's just not the case for Maryland and Delaware. If you focus on habitat creation, you're gonna get just a flood of natural species infill and you shouldn't think all of them are gonna be problem children like the nutria. You can get a healthy intact ecosystem that includes predators and diverse saltgrass marsh species that will help to sustain and maintain as much coastline as you can. Both Maryland and Delaware, more than many states, are going to need to engage in some strategic retreat from the rising seas and then develop resilience from these fallback positions. You will need as much or more buffer between the sea and your communities than you had 100 years ago, what with the projected increases in storm intensity. And much of that buffer zone will need to be nurtured like a garden, that nature is gonna do more than you think to help you there. If you build it, they will come. Not just species that will help prevent coastal erosion and clean your water, but species that will help drive the sort of year round tourism potential that we currently see in Myrtle Beach. That's my advice to you. Identify places for retrenchment, embrace the new, and look out for nutria. You have some precious areas that are being lost to the sea, but that doesn't take away your future in a climate with pleasant year-round potential. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe, help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.